All right. Um, how's it going, guys? I am Dr. Gill, and today we're going to talk about a concept from John Rawls, um, justice is fairness. So this is present in, you know, several of Rawls' works. He wrote a big, long book um, about this. He has several papers as well. So um, let's go ahead and get into it. So justice historically has been kind of a difficult concept to pin down. Um, it says something about society, of course, you know, how we arrange our society. And it's kind of taken as a given that justice is something that we want, right? Um, but historically, philosophers have, you know, they've kind of debated what just actually means. Um, in Plato's Republic, we hear about you know how exactly we get a just society what does it entail do we even actually want a just society do most people want a just society um aristotle seems to say that just justice kind of emanates from those who are virtuous of character um, and that one's virtuosity uh, is likely influenced by their environment um and there's a whole history of philosophers who discuss the concept of justice um, we're not going to go through all of those because that would be, uh, you know, that'd be a whole course of stuff and and, and uh, years of study, right? So what we are looking to today is uh, justice is fairness. So John Rawls, who is a you know 20th century, or excuse me, yeah, 20th century philosopher, um, he comes up with this idea of justice as fairness. It's a novel idea of justice based on a few assumptions about humanity, um, and not necessarily assumptions about humanity, but, you know, because oftentimes in philosophy and political theory, what we're looking for is the ideal um, that we can base a society on. So what, what are human beings at their, at their best, maybe? Um, so human beings are rational creatures, um, and as such, we want the best for ourselves. Um, we're social, so we live among other people. You know, um, sometimes we might think that it's better to live individually. Some people do, um, but we certainly wouldn't have had te the technological uh, pro progress, the improvements on quality of life and, and things like that if we didn't live among others, which leads us to the last point, which is that it's mutually advantageous to live among other people. So people are better off together than we are alone, right? And I think few people will actually disagree with that. Um, some might, um, but I think that's kind of a uh, minority position, right? Uh, we are able to benefit each other living in society. We're also able to harm each other, um, but but in large part, we can benefit each other. The reason why we have, you know, air conditioning, why I have, you know, roof and things around me is that I can't do these things myself. Um, there are people that have the abilities to do this. Okay. All right. So how do we get to justice as fairness? And I'm kind of moving myself around here. Um, or how do we structure society such that it's going to benefit us all? Okay. There's... A problem you know we run into it almost immediately what if we're biased in our concept of justice or our understanding of justice right going back we already talked about kind of Rawls's assumptions well Rawls's assumptions is that we're rational and rational means that we want what's best for ourselves um, but rationality might also lead us to, or our, our, our selfish nature, maybe not our rationality, our selfishness um, might lead us to try to rig the game of society in our favor. That is, we might seek to make rules that benefit us and our kind over others. Um, are we not kind of inclined to write rules of society that benefit us at a cost to others. And I think this is something that a lot of people, um, when they consider justice, are very concerned about, right? Is that justice if we write rules that speak only to ourselves and do not actually benefit others, okay? Um, so given the fact that we assume rationality and that we want what's best for ourselves, um, our question for justice, or quest for justice seems to be doomed, right? 
we can't really ever be impartial, right? If we're if we're basing justice on things that we know about ourselves, right? In my perfect world, people like me, um, I will, you know, I want everybody else to do well, but at the very least, I want me to do well, right? And that's how most people, you know, believe, right? How can we have justice if we're all motivated reasoners? That is, if we're always trying to mold justice and mold society into something that benefits us uh, with very little care for others, right? Well, Rawls has a workaround for this. Rawls says that what if we abstracted away from our particular circumstances? Right, so I know my strengths and my weaknesses. I know how I grew up. Um, how much money my parents had, um, how that benefits me, how maybe the lack of money that my parents had is a detriment to me. Um, so what can I do to ensure or, or how can we think in a way that abstracts away from those current circumstances and allows us to think of a society that would be mutually beneficial, okay, that a rational person without – all that knowledge about himself would be willing to enter into, okay? So imagine that you know nothing about yourself, right? You know absolutely nothing about yourself. You don't know how tall you are. You don't know your hair color. Uh, you don't know how much money your parents will make. And you don't have any idea of actually how intelligent you are. You know, it's kind of a difficult thing to do if you're this perfectly rational creature. But just imagine you know nothing of yourself. So if you knew nothing of yourself, what society would you hope to be born into? You knew absolutely nothing of yourself. If you knew nothing of yourself, would you want to live in a society where very tall or very short people couldn't vote? Where people with small eyes weren't allowed to watch Netflix? Uh, where those with big feet couldn't wear shoes? Um, I think that most people in those cases would say, no, well, I wouldn't want to live in a, in a society where very tall people or short people couldn't vote, right? Because knowing nothing about myself, I run the risk of being very tall or very short, right? And as such, I run the risk of not being able to vote, right? If I know nothing about myself and I have end up, you know, born with small eyes, I'm never allowed to watch Netflix. Uh, it's kind of a silly um, example. Well, what if I have big feet? Well, they just don't make shoes for you. Too bad, right? Are those the type of societies you want to live in? These are kind of joking answers, but we'll get into some more serious stuff. Um, probably you would not want to live in that sort of society. Now, what about this? If you didn't know your skin color, would you want to live in a society that allowed discrimination based on race? If you had no idea if you were white or black, would you want to live in a society based on race, right? Or a society that allows discrimination? Well, probably not, right? Because actually, you know, majority of people on the face of the earth are people of color, right? And we know historically um, that we've seen a lot of discrimination, slavery, abuses uh, for people of people of color, right? So... If you had no idea what color you would be, would you want to live in a society that allowed discrimination? Probably not, right? You would probably say, well, my chances of being born a person of color are fairly high. And therefore, I would not want to live in a place where I would be likely to be discriminated upon. Right? And this is just an abstract idea, right? You might say, well, I don't want to live in that as a white person, right? Because I don't want um, my fellow man to be discriminated against. And that's absolutely understandable. But remember, we're trying to take this from an abstract um, position, right? An abstract position of the perfectly uh, rational, selfish person. Okay. All right. So next question, if you didn't know, if you would grow up wealthy or poor, what would you prefer society to look like? Right? You have no idea whether or not you're going to have parents that are wealthy, whether or not you're going to be the next Jeff Bezos, whether or not you're going to be Elon Musk. You have no clue, right? Would you want to be 
in a society where you had a one in a billion shot of becoming incredibly wealthy. Whereas on the flip side, if you did not get that one in a billion shot, you had a chance of being a very high chance of being incredibly poor, incredible levels of poverty. Is that a society that you'd want to live in? Or if you didn't know how wealthy or poor you would be, would you want to live in a society that ensured a baseline of economic prosperity such that nobody is born into the kind of grinding levels of poverty that exist in the world, right? So that kind of calculus is up to you. Um, a rational person, at least in, in accordance with um, Rawls, I think would go for the latter, right? They would say, well, my chances of becoming that billionaire are very low and my chances of becoming um, or living in high poverty are very high, right? So I would prefer if I'm doing this from a, from a place of not knowing anything about myself personally, I would prefer to go into a society that had a base le level of economic prosperity so that nobody, there's 0% chance that I go into this world um, being incredibly poor, right? So what Rawls talks about is this idea of a veil of ignorance. You know, if you're behind this veil of ignorance, you don't know anything about yourself. What would you want society to look like? Right. You don't know how talented you will be. You don't know how athletic you will be. Right. So you can't carry in with you those circumstances. Right. And if you do carry in, in those circumstances, then you're not behind that veil of ignorance. Right. So if you were behind that veil of ignorance, how equal would you want society to be? Would you want it to be perfectly equal to where there's absolutely no differences between people? Would you want it to be not equal at all and just be a, you know, kind of a chance of where you fall? Or would you like to allow natural differences, but ensure baseline of, of support for people? Okay. We're going to talk about some of these differences. Okay. Would you like to live in a society that took you as far as your abilities go, right? Society should only be equal to the extent that is natural. The cream rises to the top. If you're a stud at football or art or whatever, you, you know, you do well in that world, right? If you're incredibly talented at, with computers, you might be the next Steve Jobs or, you know, some, you know, billionaire computer uh, designer. So this is kind of the idea of a meritocracy, right? It sounds great. Those of us who are successful and are good at things will rise to the top, right? It's hard to, um, on its face, think that that's a bad idea, right? We don't put people in the NFL that are not good at football. That wouldn't be very fun to watch or maybe, maybe it'd be incredible to watch. Um, but it, it would – there's something in us, I think, a lot of us that would say, well, that's – we want the best. The people that are the best at things should be able to do them, right? Well, the problem with this is that it, it falls in this category is what's known as moral luck. That is, within certain limits, we can't really control how uh, athletic or intelligent or wealthy we'll become. Right. These are factors that are oftentimes completely out of our control. Right. Are our parents very wealthy? Do we happen to have the genes to be um, incredibly athletic? Were we raised in the right circumstances to be um, intelligent? Right. So all these different um, advantages, ultimately, at least in society today and um, in this world that we're speaking of where uh, nature is is given kind of complete reign, um, they allow people to be treated differently in society. So the question is morally, right? Morally, do people who are born with more ability and advantage, um, do they have an advantage when it comes to living in society? Or should they have an advantage when it comes to living in society, right? Should strong people get to do whatever they like um, while the weak suffer? Um, should intelligent people be able to rule the world while people who haven't had the same education uh, live in 
grinding poverty? Uh, should those who are wealthy get to do you know whatever they want with their wealth while everyone else um, lives in destitution? Right? These are the type of questions. And it's a moral question, right? What does it have to do with what does your moral look? How does that relate? to the advantages that you have in society. Now, some people say, well, no, of course not. We think that um, there are certain types of advantages that are, are built um, and that are unjust, right? So becoming really, you know, being a great football player might just come from the fact that you are, uh, you know, genetically <laughs> disposed to it. So, but we believe that people should have the ability to rise or fall based on their own abilities and their work ethics, right? So people are, you know, hard workers and they have good abilities. Well, that then they should be able to succeed, right? And that does sound good, right? We certainly don't like the idea of, say, everybody getting the same grade in class. But what if you're born with low abilities, right? What if the amount of money your parents make gives you an advantage? And then you pass that down to your kids, right? So do people that have less money or less ability deserve a less prosperous and happy life? That's a moral question, right? Should people who are born with less ability um, or maybe we could change this. What if somebody has a disability? Does somebody with a disability, do they deserve a less prosperous and happy life? Or are those factors actually arbitrary when we're determining one's worth and thus one's place in society. Okay. Now, this is not to say that we just let anybody do any job regardless of qualifications, but it does kind of push us to answer a question of how um, people should be placed in society, how much opportunities they should have, Is there another way of organizing society such that people with different abilities are able to still live prosperous, happy lives? So in these previous examples, people with different abilities and acquired wealth benefits um, that benefit their descendants um, are subject to kind of a moral lottery, right? If we allow society to exist without any sort of conditions, right? If we don't try to make society equal, then people who are born um, with greater abilities or people with uh, more wealth will have advantages in society. So that's the question. Should we leave our place in society up to a moral lottery or is there a better way? Now, remember, when we're trying to understand Rawls, Rawls is going to say, okay, let's abstract away from our personal case. So maybe you're wealthy, right? Maybe you're strong. Maybe you're athletic, right? But you don't know that, right? You have no idea in, under the veil of ignorance. So under the veil of ignorance, if you're trying to figure out from an unbiased perspective how society should be structured, well, then you have to kind of take all those things that you know about yourself and put them aside, right? And this is a way of kind of understanding how other people might be in society. So let's return back to the original position. The just society is a society that is arranged such that, right, liberty, the most liberty that we can each have access to, is accessible to all, right? So I think this is somewhat fairly easy to understand. Everybody should be able to do whatever they want such that it does not impinge upon other people's liberty. Okay. So murder can never be allowed in the just society. Why? Because that would clearly deprive others of their liberty as would stealing. Right. And then you can get into more nuanced cases and talk about different legalities. Would drugs be legal in this perfectly just society? Well, Seeming maybe up until the point where it started to harm others or it started to deprive others of their liberty. And the second portion of the original position is that of equality. So 
let me frame this in the negative. Inequality is permissible only to the extent that it benefits all. Okay? So what Rawls is saying here is that there are going to be inequalities, right? We can't iron out all the differences between human beings because that would completely destroy, you know, human beings. It would destroy, um, one, it would completely erase all the liberty that we had. Um, further, it would be impossible. And it would get rid of our personality, right? Our personhood, our autonomy, our, our separateness, and our uniqueness. So... What type of inequality is permissible? Well, maybe we want more inequality to allow people to um, have more self-actualization, right? Maybe we want people to be able to kind of make their own choices. And as such, as, as a you know society that wants to allow more freedom, we allow higher levels of, of inequality. Maybe we want to allow some people to make higher levels of, of wealth. Um, such that they can invest in society. Uh, that might be the case. We don't actually know because we've never had a, you know, an incredibly equal society. But does higher levels of wealth concentration uh, lead to more investment? Um, now, again, equality or excuse me, inequality is only acceptable such that it benefits all, right? So. Um, those two kind of principles are the core or the core principles or core positions of the original position that Rawls um, kind of bases society on now uh, or a just society thinks that a just society should be based on now the question of whether or not you know what that society actually looks like well that's something that has to be thought through right and that's whether or not you buy um, you buy Rawls in the first place okay all right um, that is it for Rawls and Justice is Fairness. Uh, thanks for watching.